Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics. This lecture is entitled Sequential Circuits. Okay, so up until this point, we have been dealing with what is known as combinational logic circuits. A combinational logic circuit, if you remember, is something that directly responds to its current inputs and changes its outputs. And now we're going to step into a different world which represents a major transition in digital electronics where we're going to talk about sequential circuits. Sequential circuits can remember past states and based off those past states and current inputs will combine to create a new state. This is kind of the basis of memory and one of the biggest applications for sequential circuits is a counter. And that's one of the first things we're going to discuss because one of the basics about counting, I mean think about it, if you forgot which number you're at if you're counting, you would not make a good counter. You would count from 0, 1, where was I? Okay, so it has to have some basis in memory. So a counter needs to remember where it's at currently so it can increment to its next state. Next application is obviously a register, a memory. Computers are going to store information. You may have your research topic that's due, your research paper that's due, and you need to go ahead and store that so a computer can store those in the form of ones and zeros so that way you can go out and play and come back to it. There are two different kinds of sequential circuits. Kind of based off the inputs is synchronous versus asynchronous. Think of the word synchronous, synchronization, time, synchronous. Basically, it means that inputs need to be synchronized. And how you synchronize it is with this thing called a clock, which we'll go into a little bit later. What is a clock? It's basically the heartbeat of a digital electronics system all inputs need to be synchronized with the clock. Whereas an asynchronous input is without respect to a clock. Those inputs can come in regardless if the clock signal is there or not and the system will respond to that. Okay, synchronous versus asynchronous. Two important concepts. With respect to time, without respect to time. The next thing I'd like to discuss is this difference and introduce you now, we'll come back to these a little bit later, the difference between more and mealy finite state machines. A counter, think about it, what is the next state of a counter? Well, it's dependent upon its present state. So what a more finite state machine, and that's what exactly what a counter is, there's a specific finite number of positions it can count to. I can have a 0 to 9 counter versus a 0 to 15 counter. So there's a finite number of states it can get into, but the example of a more machine, what I'm using is its next state is dependent only upon its present state. Whereas what's known as a mealy finite state machine, its next state is dependent upon the present state and external inputs. So let me go ahead and write those down. And there you go, those are the descriptions of a more versus a mealy finite state machine. And an example of a mealy finite state machine might be a counter also, but for example, it has a select switch between two different modes, up or down. So for example, I am in present state seven, What's my next state in up mode? It's an external input. Okay, the next state would be eight. Whereas if my external input was in down mode, what would be my next state? It'd be six. The finite state machines, we're gonna go into a little bit greater detail, but kind of the thrust of this lecture is to get you prepared for some of the terminology that we're gonna be using in sequential circuits. And one of the big divisions, uh, one of the big uh, terms here is what's known as a multivibrator. The multivibrator can be divided into three types of multivibrators. As the name implies, vibrate, it's changing. So an A-stable multivibrator. A-stable, if you could think about asynchronous, you know, without respect to time, astable means it's not stable. It continually bounces back and forth between two states. What might those two states be in a binary world? Zero and a one. So an astable multivibrator is known as an oscillator or a clock. Okay, that is the heartbeat of our digital electronic system. So what would an astable multivibrator look like on our first tie band diagram? Chances are it would look something like this. And there it is, an A-stable multivibrator was a zero, then it goes to a one, gets tired of being a one, goes back to a zero, and one, and so forth and so on. An A-stable multivibrator, also known as an oscillator or a clock. 
One of the key things to remember about a clock, it's got a repeatable frequency and a repeatable period and a duty cycle, which you should remember from earlier in digital electronics education. Okay, the next type of multivibrator is what's known as a bi-stable multivibrator. Whereas the A-stable constantly bounces between zero and one, only temporarily hanging out in those regions, a bi-stable has two stable states and it can store either a one or a zero depending upon its inputs. Think of a memory device. There are two types of memory devices which we're going to discuss, latches and flip-flops. It's kind of hard to draw what a bi-stable multivibrator looks like on a time and diagram without really going into how they work, but say for example there is a trigger event which stores a one right there. What's going to happen is the output for that bi-stable multivibrator is going to be a logical one and it's going to stay a logical one until you turn the thing off or you say store a zero now so it can however long that thing is on and functional it can store that one or a zero because it's bi stable it stores a one or a zero okay mono stable mono stable means it has one stable state either a one or a zero However, it can temporarily assume the other state for a measurable period based upon a trigger input. Okay, so I'm going to draw two timing diagrams to describe what I'm talking about, a monostable multivibrator. Okay, so what I've got is two timing diagrams right here, and the top one is the, what's called a trigger input, and our Q, that's the output of our monostable multivibrator. And let's pretend this monostable multivibrator's stable state, i.e. its monostable state, is a zero. However, it can temporarily assume the opposite state, i.e. a one, based upon, let's say, positive edge trigger. Okay, and we'll talk about positive edges in a little bit. And it's going to temporarily assume that logical value of one for five nanoseconds. So what happens? This monostable multivibrator, the output Q, is zero. It's in its monostable state until a rising edge for our trigger comes along. What happens? It can temporarily assume the opposite state for five nanoseconds. One, two, three, four, five nanoseconds, at which time it reverts back to its monostable state. So you should be able to understand the difference between the three multivibrators, namely A-stable, bi-stable, and monostable and recognize on a timing diagram which particular multivibrator I'm talking about. Let's go into some further details about clocks. You think you knew it all about clocks when you could discuss frequency, period, pulse width, and duty cycle. I'm here to tell you there's a little bit more detail that we need to go into clocks beyond stuff that I already expect you to know. So I discussed the importance of the clock in sequential circuits to namely synchronize activity. And think about that term synchronization. It means basically paying attention. So we've got to figure out when in this clock signal are we paying attention? Where is the one to do uh, musical terminology? Are we playing on the one or on the two? When does that particular section start? Where do we pay attention to our inputs for synchronized inputs? One would think that a clock which goes from zero to one, you got two choices, zero or one. And in actuality, you have four choices. You can do what's called active high. I can pay attention when my clock is high. All those times, I pay attention to my input. I could do the opposite active low. I could pay attention only when the input is low. However, there are three, excuse me, two other times I could pay attention. And this is really neat. I can define a very, very, very narrow region of time. Think about those active highs. In particular case, let's say each block is one nanoseconds, two nanoseconds wide versus the active low. It's a lot wider. What I'm going to do is, okay, at this particular instant of time, and I know it's not instantaneous because there is a, a little transition from rising to falling. What about the edges? What if I paid attention right there? I'm going to use a different color for this. What if I paid attention right there at the rising edge? Okay, because it's going from zero to one. That's what's known as a rising edge. Or I could call it a positive edge. It's going from zero to a positive one or a leading edge. Okay, so these are all three interchangeable terminologies. What I use the most is positive edge. Just as equally, I could pay attention to the falling edge. Okay, that is known as negative edge because it's going from one down to a zero. A falling edge, again, uh, one down to zero 
trailing edge. It's the end of a pulse. If I'm at positive edge detection, I'm just paying attention here, 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 here. Where is it negative edge? Right there, right there, right there, right there. Now, there's typically not positive and negative edge detection devices, with the exception of Master Slave, JK flip flops, don't worry about that right now. A device typically is only paying attention on one of these four possible inputs. Schematically, how do I represent a device that is active high enabled versus active low enabled versus positive edge enabled versus negative edge enabled? There's some schematic shortcuts with that, and here are the four symbols that you'll see for active high, active low, positive edge, and negative edge. So here are four generic devices that in this particular example, I'm using a signal called EN, or enable, to determine synchronization for this particular sequential circuit. Okay, the first one in the upper left hand, the enable. It's just got nothing on it. That's active high. Whereas the one immediately below it, if I put a bubble, i.e. an inversion in front of it, that means active low. A positive edge detection in the upper right hand side, it's got this caret symbol. And what do you think of the one in the lower right? It's got a caret symbol for an edge, but it's got a bubble for an inversion. It's negative edge detection. So there is our verbal description of it. Active high has no indicator on the enable. Active low has got a little bubble on it. Positive edge has got that carrot. Negative edge has the carrot with the bubble. In the example of a bi-stable multivibrator, i.e. it's going to store, let's pretend that output Q right there, as, and that's our, this is our in, we'll go into exactly what those ins are right now. If that enable is high and the in says to Q, store me a zero, what's the value of Q? It's a zero. If the enable is high and the input says store me a one, what is Q? It stores you a one. However, if enable is low and the input says store me a zero, what does that device do? It does nothing because it's not enabled, okay? So it's storing that previous one in there. Okay, so that's how these enables are worked, active high versus active low versus positive edge and negative edge. Now let's do an example for one of the edges. Okay, say for example, here's my input. I'm going to do it for a negative edge. I've got an input that says store me a 1 on Q. However, negative edge detection on enable is not detecting a negative edge. What is the value of Q? Okay, the answer is is whatever was stored in there previously. What if there was something unknown in there? Well, the answer is, is unknown. So that input, let's say now it's saying store me one, and then all of a sudden a negative edge happens. What happens? Q becomes a one. And then that input goes away, and as long as there is no other negative edge occurring, it's going to stay a 1. Okay, so this is pretty cool. We are using some basic terminologies to already describe the function of some of the sequential circuits we'll be building. And we'll talk about one of the most basic ones in our next lecture, which is called an SR latch. Then we're going to go on to a D latch, a JK flip-flop, and a D flip-flop. So there's a basic sequence of things that we're going to go through here. And we're going to do a little bit of a diversion from the SR latch. We're going to just talk about basic SR latches, then we're going to get into gated latches, which I've already kind of described just here, and then we're going to go into the D latch, JK flip-flop, and D flip-flop, and kind of the sequence of these things is, is you need to understand how a SR latch works before you move on to a D latch, and you need to know how a D latch works before you move on to a JK flip-flop, and to understand a, J, excuse me, a D flip-flop, you got to understand how a JK flip-flop works, so we're all kind of building on top of each other, and uh, don't neglect one of them and think that you can just pick it up later because it's using the basis of some of those previously defined devices before it to describe this particular device's behavior. I hate to draw generalizations, but let's go ahead and draw a generalization that is not necessarily held by a lot of people, or by everybody within the digital electronics community. Latch versus flip-flop. Here's my generalization. These are either active high or active low enabled. A flip-flop is edge detection you may see the term latch and flip-flop used incorrectly. Shoot, I might even be using them incorrectly, but that's how I'm going to try to, to, that is my generalization of how these work. Let's move on to the SR latch, the basic SR latch, which forms the basis of these following devices.